Hello, and welcome to the People Grow Places podcast, where we explore the virtuous circle of people, growth, and place. Brought to you by Grow Places and hosted by our founder, Tom Larson. David, hi. Hi, Tom. Thanks for joining me today. It's really great to have you on. And um, I know we're going to have a great conversation today, a ranging subject about what you're doing at Zero Zero, why Zero Zero, what, what the whole thing kind of means for you a little bit as well, personally. So really grateful for that. So just to start us off, maybe if you could introduce yourself and then sort of take us back a little bit to, to, to how you've got to where you, you have, really. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. I'm David Saxby, clearly one of the, what well, we'd say, many founders of Zero Zero. Um, it started back um, about 2004, throwing myself and Indy Joe Harping at university, but uh, we wouldn't exclusively say we founded Zero Zero. We built Zero Zero through a very sort of open, collaborative, organic way, and everybody who's joined us in some way sort of helps found it again and grows it and diversifies it. So yeah, we're now a studio of about 20 people, but with a number of other sort of spin-off ventures and um, sort of confusingly diverse activities. But we're based in London largely, although the, the network does span globally and we even have people working us on a day-to-day basis from as far off as New Zealand, as we were talking about earlier. Um, but yes, we're... I'd say we we haven't uh, we still haven't yet cracked it as such, and maybe that's not the purpose. It's uh, we're we're constantly exploring what it means to be designing and trying to shape place in in London to start with, but actually in the early twenty first century. So, so what, what do you think that means then? <laughs> what do you think it means to be designing and shaping places in the early twenty first century? I think it's a huge responsibility and I know we're going to sort of move on to try and understand and this is a bit like therapy, me, myself understand why do we do what we do but I, I think that's probably something we'll, we'll come back to. I think it's a, a huge social responsibility. Um, we do, we are a, a profession that affects others' lives, um, maybe indirectly. Um, I know I wouldn't take anything away from a, a doctor or a nurse who's literally saving lives, but we believe that the built environment does actually afford people sort of opportunity. It, it gives them a, a platform to, to actually then make what they want to do maybe harder or easier. And clearly we're also at a, a moment where environmentally it's a huge responsibility and I'll be honest, say we're challenged by that. I don't think there are any easy answers. The easiest answer is maybe to stop building. But um, yeah, it's so so doing what we do at this moment in, in time, I think is, uh, yeah, it, it's a huge responsibility, but someone's got to try. <laughs> someone's got to actually think, well, how do we respond to these imperatives? And I say not necessarily we'll have the right answers, but I think trying to bring an integrity to, to how we try to answer it. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree generally. And as you say, that the this um, you know slightly sort of gut reaction sometimes to think, okay, well, if we stop, things would be better. When in rea- the, the reality is that um, you know we talk about growth on this yeah. platform and. And growth in all senses is this kind of sort of continually moving, regenerative kind of process. And cities as kind of organisms and obviously people as well, we we are constantly growing and changing. And you could one level class, you know, everything we're going through societally as kind of growing pains in that sense. Um, But, you know, we are at a very cute moment, aren't we, at the moment in in history where probably for the first time there is this kind of you know our knowledge coupled with our actions like there's a responsibility kind of sits in the middle of that now as opposed to maybe previous generations where at least on mass that sort of notion of responsibility hasn't really been as high up the priority list yeah I, I, I you, you can't deny it 
you can't claim ignorance. And therefore, if you're going to act, you're going to have to act with a consciousness. And uh, yeah, I think it's posing some real questions. My sort of, my journey started with a, a well-known practice, very well-known practice who pioneered the kind of low energy approach to, to architecture. And yeah, been from, from the sort of fuel crises of the, the 1970s, we thought that operational energy was actually sort of the, the key. And a lot of great work was done how to design low energy buildings. Actually, sort of, I, I sort of left that behind because actually I thought, well, all the answers that were there, it's about getting them deployed, getting them, and I think the industry has stepped up and actually through stick and carrot, we have made huge strides in, in delivering buildings that are, are lower energy. The, the, the building regulations, the sort of baseline, actually have, have really set very high standards. Um, but when we set up Zero Zero, we, we already felt that the kind of the agenda had to be wider than that. And I say that not just sort of from energy to, to the, the environment, but also the, the, the social sort of side of, of what it mean to be sustainable was the, was the word at the time. And I like, yeah, that you've already picked up on regenerative. I say, I think that's, that's a nuance and a sophistication to the argument. It's no longer sort of the, the conservation and the, the reduced consumption. We've actually got to look that we are a, a sort of living organism individually, but also on, on mass. So we will consume, but what does that consumption look like? But now we sort of from low energy, we're into actually look at the whole environmental impact of building and the embodied energy. And actually this is a real sort of on a weekly basis, something we're, we're wrestling with because there's a vast amount of resources and energy required to build any building. And at this critical moment in time, do we really even have that energy to invest? We, uh, a very, very sustainable low energy building is likely to still have a, a, a sort of a, a return on that investment, a, 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 a net zero carbon sort of horizon of probably 20 years. When the crisis is now, and if we haven't addressed it in those 20 years, well, it's all over. We will have massive destruction. So I do think there could be a moratorium on building. You just say, well, we've got to be really creative for the next 20 years before we have enough credit and we've addressed systemically sort of how we consume um, to, to afford to do it again. That's sort of one step sort of beyond just the, the do nothing. But um, yeah, I, I don't believe it is actually the, the answer. We, we've got to think of ways and be more creative and address the issue beyond just the built environment. Because I, I know historically it's been a very large part of our impact on, on the global environment. Thankfully it's decreasing but at the same time, other impacts globally are, are rapidly increasing. Mm. You talk about beyond the built environment and, and every time I think about zero zero, that's where my mind goes. And in a really, really positive way, you know, the work that you were all doing around being action led, as you say, you know, whether it's leaving an established business to set up because you want to take action yeah. um, through to stuff that broadly speaking, isn't necessarily architecture. It's thought leadership, it's systems change, it's, it's, it's uh, policy making. Yeah. So that beyond the environment bit, why, why do you feel like that's important for you or why do you feel like you've ended up in that space? Well, I say this, this does take us right back and it, it's also, it's good for, for me in, in some ways to remind myself of why we did do what we did and why we're doing what we're doing. And it was exactly that, to, to realise that if you just look at the building as, as a physical thing, 
you're not appreciating its impact and its impact is systemic across supply chains and as say operation energy but also though those lives it either enables or or frustrates and say Indy who was part of those very early conversations now leads Dark Matter Labs, part of the, the Zero Zero family, which is sort of pushing sort of on policy, on economics, on, on really those sort of enabling infrastructures, that, that that's the sort of the dark matter of the world we build, what actually sort of frames what you can or can't achieve with building. So I, I think we were back in 2004 already aware that you're not going to solve these problems through simply looking at the buildings. You've got to, to look at actually what, what the building is configuring in some ways, what, what, what it's driving. Um, and our journey over nearly 20 years now um, has, has come not quite full circle because it's bifurcated in, in various ways. But maybe four, three, four years ago, having done a range of explorations, a group of us within Zero Zero said, well, now is the time to return to buildings. And with that, can we design buildings that sort of purposely are trying to, to kind of configure? We, we often use the word infrastructure. We sometimes use the word create platforms this sort of more holistic kind of view of and, and say this leads on to that sort of action a lot of our design is not meant to be complete our design is meant to be the sort of the heavy lifting that then creates the opportunity and that opportunity is for others action because we can't control the world say we wouldn't want to but we, we, re we recognize that people will be motivated to do what they do. How can we support that? Um, how, how can we, say, give them or frame or, or create the, the, maybe the first step to them to, to go on and whatever sort of field they're in, they can sort of start to, to drill down and, and, and get, reach further in some of these issues. It's kind of the, the last 20 years has sort of almost given us a framework to understand what the role of the building and the built environment is. And that's very useful because it also kind of helps us to sort of understand what it's not. And we, we won't worry about the things that that's not for us the role of the architecture. Um, and I think through that lens, it allows us to be more specific, more particular, more focused on what we are now trying to achieve with our buildings. Mm. I'm putting words in your mouth, but that kind of like incompleteness, kind of recognising that incompleteness of buildings or projects or even places and allowing for something else to come along and kind of continue that story is really, really, um, really interesting. And, and you're, in everything you do, you're talking about architecture places the environment through the lens of improving people's lives so why do you for you personally you know aside from zero zero and things what, what why do you feel like that kind of um empathetic side you know that kind of a, a, appealing to enhance people's quality of life comes from for you yeah i, I say I, I i'm not sure we can ever claim that we will improve someone's lives through what we do we can hope to we can hope to, to, to create opportunities where maybe they can. But to, to back to your question, sort of what is it, not just in me, but also I, I think in the, the shared values of, of everyone in our studio, I think we recognise the world can be an incredibly unequal place. And through all of our journeys, we've all probably been very fortunate and to be here where we are is probably a very privileged place to be. And for me, maybe it, it, it's a way of actually sort of reconciling that. If, if I've been afforded this, this privilege, this opportunity, 
what can I do with it? What do I, what would I find personally rewarding having been given that opportunity? Um, I think it is to sort of, to pass it on. And that probably comes around to the founding of Zero Zero, the culture of the studio. Um, it's very much about collectively, we, we can achieve more than each of us striving individually, but it is a place for, for growth. And actually, if, if individuals grow and ultimately outgrow the studio, that's quite a success too. And I mentioned we, we've spun various ventures out and seeing those individuals and those ventures, say the Dark Matter Labs, there's Open Systems Labs run by Alistair Parvin, there's Open Desk, the furniture company set up by Johnny Steiner and, and Nick Iridiakonu. Um, it's, it's great. We were a conduit. Um, we nurtured, um, we helped support and build, and, and they've gone on to, 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 to great stuff. And if we're really deeply interested in sort of having a positive effect in the world, whether it's under the sort of tight umbrella of, of Zero Zero, which isn't very tight, or whether it's independently as these sort of spin-offs, it, it really doesn't matter. It's, it's not that we're trying to control it and somehow sort of personally profit, it's what maximises that, that impact. So um, yeah, that's a very long-winded as all, all my answers are, but maybe that does give a, a bit of a, an insight. We sort of, there is a, I think, a, a really wonderful spirit in the studio of people say it, it's so selfless. Um, it's incredibly hard working. It's not some sort of utopia. Um, but I think people are can can be hard working and can be motivated because they believe that actually, yeah, that that's the way they can contribute. Absolutely, and um, thank you for sharing that because that's as you say, kind of the deeper reasons why you're doing it. And, and as an outsider, that totally comes across. You know, um, the way that zero zero has evolved as you say into this kind of this kind of organism in a way that is kind of slightly bigger than the sum of the parts in a way and it kind of uh, reaches across the, the globe doesn't it in terms of its its reach and its network um so i do think that's kind of you you kind of you are delivering on those those values and that mission in that sense and if there's anyone out there kind of who want to kind of get a look under the bonnet so to speak and kind of understand what kind of how does that actually work in practice what are the kind of practical steps to like a a day in the studio about a project or because because you still you're still although you're creating your own way of working you're still operating in a bigger system of yeah. clients and briefs and projects oh, yeah and, and so, <laughs> how, so, so how do you kind of sort of marry those two ideals really yeah you're you're right we have to be sort of entirely dependable from a client's point of view yeah thankfully we've managed to, to attract uh, sort of some, some extraordinary clients who there is an alignment of, of vision and uh, and a, a sort of trust in, in the integrity of each other's values that, that that enable us to do things but no they still have deadlines they still have budgets they still have risks to manage and stakeholders to bring on board so it's probably a benchmark or a, a sort of an absolute line is the we have a commitment to, to deliver to a standard that that actually a, a client would expect of any other architect, let's say that they're, they're coming to us uh, about an architectural project. But then sort of behind that in, in the studio, um, it probably starts a long way behind that. We've grown the practice through largely meeting people of, of sort of who we recognize share the values and complement what we do. And probably most importantly, we recognize their opportunity to grow with us. And so we, we brought people in from day one of diverse backgrounds and, and skill sets and educations. And by having them in the room, that's almost shaped our direction. Um, I remember being asked um, fairly early on in Zero Zero by a, a panel about where will you be in five years? And I said, I don't know where we'll be. I know what we're 
interested in pursuing and where that takes us, who knows? And I think to this day, we, we don't have a, a fixed destination of one day we are going to design that particular building. We just think, well, whatever question someone poses us, we know how we, we're going to answer it with the, the sum of the, the sort of views and, and personalities in the studio, which um, I say, whilst, whilst there is a, a, a diversity, actually deep down, I think there's a, a very strong culture and sort of shared belief in this. So then on the day-to-day -day basis, yes, like every, every other practice, opportunities arise, you see invitations and tenders, you, you look at them and decide, well, do we have something to add? Because sort of that's not just, well, sort of, do we think we can add something to this? It's looking at the other perspective. If we can't add something to it, we're going to waste our time doing a tender. We're not going to be selected by a certain client if what we do doesn't appeal, it doesn't address their grief, it doesn't add value to, to what, what their ambitions are. So we, we sort of have opportunities, we pursue them, we're always up against sort of high quality competition. So I say if there's five on a short list, you've probably got a one in five chance. Um, which of the five competitions we do, we win, or the invitation of the tenders or the, the interviews we get, we win, you don't control. So there's always a, a little bit of kind of, um, yeah, just serendipity in the projects we're actually working on. But through filtering them, hopefully all of them, and so we've been very lucky that uh, today, I, I don't think there are many, if any, projects that we've had gone through the studio where we can't find something to be passionate about. Once we've landed the project, then it's actually fitting the right people to it. And that's not just how many years experience do you have on this, whose who's passions, whose who's sort of empathies actually fit with this client and this brief. And people do, someone might be more interested in housing, someone might be more interested in, in something else, more infrastructural, sort of even commercial, with that converted comments on it. And so we then try, and being a smallish studio, say just before you came in, we, we had a Monday morning sort of resources meeting. We talk about what everyone's working on, who's got capacity in the short term, but also what's coming up in the medium term and how can we just sort of manipulate our, our, our resources so the right people can finally get to the right project at the right stage. So it's great because it, it's we're still small enough to, to for that to be fairly organic and for everybody in the studio more or less to know what everybody else's interests are and sort of recognize how sort of creating within the work we do secure the opportunities for them to to, to, to grow. So um, yeah, it's probably very similar to, to, to how most practices do try and make sure people are working on things that actually sort of really keep them sort of inspired and motivated. Because I, I think for, for us, when we in, sort of interview people coming into the studio, it really is about, are we going to give you the opportunity to grow and learn? If not, sort of after a couple of years, well, they'll choose somewhere else to go and grow and learn. And that's a huge investment that, that you first put in that you don't want to lose. So unless we sit there and think this person hopefully will be with us in, an, in five years, not in one year or two years, or sort of in 10 years, or maybe they'll never leave. That's, that's almost the challenge we get. And we've had very, very talented people come to, to interview with us. And hopefully they've gone on to do really extraordinary things. But we've just not felt that we would be able to continue to give them the opportunities that they need on the journey that they're going on. And uh, yeah, we, we don't want to hold anyone hostage, don't want anyone here under duress. We don't want anyone to actually get to a point where they're here and frustrated. Um, so if it did come to that, say so there'd be a, well, how can we kind of give them a send off? How can we actually position them in the next part of their, their journey? 
But uh, the ideal situation is yes, you're sort of like Hotel California, you, you, you <laughs> never leave zero zero. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. And as you say, your your culture, your values are, are so strong and unique that that, that that does, you know, there's a there's a sort of um, sense of attraction, isn't there? That there's, you will probably find that people really want to work here, you know, because they really buy into the, to the, to the whole culture. And that's great. It's, it's throwing down some interesting challenges at the moment because going back to those, those wider values in the profession, we know the narrowness of the profession. So actually sort of really trying to, to encourage sort of diversity. Um, we ourselves sort of have, whilst mostly what we do is based on culture and a, a little sort of slogan we have is culture trumps contract. You can prescribe in writing what you'd like to happen, but if you don't build the culture, it's going to fail. And if you, if you find yourself having to pick up and quote someone a contract, I think that's a, a sign of failure. But actually, we need sort of actually some mechanisms that we don't just sort of somehow wallow in our own, our own culture, self-satisfied. We are challenged. So we do sort of set up various policies in the studio to try and frame what we believe. And one about sort of inclusiveness and diversity, it, we can't just sort of develop a practice that's about personal, simply sort of self-selecting like-minded people. So at least we, whilst we can meet someone we think they would be an ideal candidate to work with us, either we have a responsibility to really get out there and meet these people in all the places you could possibly find them, rather than just the ones that gravitate towards us. Or when we do recruit, we do actually cast the net wide and try and actually say there is an opportunity for anybody. And it becomes quite a big exercise. Yeah, we could quite easily have 100 plus CVs sent in and then there is a, a quite a rigid process now for how they are sort of sorted through. Um, each candidate is looked at by a number of individuals to, to, to try and strike that openness. And so it, 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 it creates quite a lot of work, but again, to have integrity in what we're doing, okay, that, that's, the, that's the price you pay. And hopefully by the time we get to the end of that sifting process, it's not only that sort of almost objectively we, we have done it, we've also actually managed to sort of reconcile it with this, this key cultural sort of, or values-based aspect of, of what the studio runs on. Yeah, no, that's really, really good to know. I hadn't actually appreciated that. And as you say, like, as you say, a way of challenging yourselves to around diversity is, is exactly that, isn't it? It's trying to sort of not self-select in terms of the types of people that come in. It's much, much broader than that. So I hadn't quite appreciated that, but that's, well, that's great. Yeah, and, and we wrestled on it and thankfully sort of we collectively in the studio write our policies. And so as long as we are self-critical about it, um, we can recognise the unintended consequences rather than blindly follow something. But um, yeah, it's uh, again, that's an, another one of the, the challenges of, of the profession um, at this moment in time. And uh, yeah, it's strangely having this conversation sort of, it is motivating to think that, yeah, we've got to get out there and do this stuff. Um, yeah, you could be slightly overwhelmed by the, the number of challenges we could, we could say that the profession is facing. But uh, okay, you can you can either get rather depressed or okay, let's try. And and it's only trying. We we don't have the answers, but as long as there's people like us and and there are that there's lots of others. Um, actually, as long as we all keep trying, hopefully some of us will succeed. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure you will. Um, and I'll. <laughs> And you talk as well. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll see. We've recruited you we'll to see. try. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So on. So on that, then maybe this segues into yeah. maybe a last question that I had to often ask you before we we do one from a previous guest. Um, and it is about what what I do. So it's about development and 
um, that whole world of you know being a property developer, being a, a client, being an enabler of projects as opposed to uh, someone designing or making. Um, and we've talked about this before, so um, I'd be interested to get your your thoughts on Mike about kind of you know how would you approach being a developer if if kind of in zero zero world you you were turning your hand to to development. Have you got any thoughts on that? I. <laughs> Yeah, we've, we've wrestled over the years and say maybe put that particular issue on the back burner for a little while, but probably my gut feeling tells me something. It, it's about sort of the, the time scale. Um, a lot of development, um, yeah, you can't deny it's an economic operation or a commercial operation. It needs to actually work in a global financial system of debt and interest and borrowing and it's this going into the sort of dark matter world of things it's regulated by a planning system um, so there's no easy answer because your, your hands are so heavily tied but if I think there's a glimmer of hope it's about how can you transcend the short term how can you actually look at securing the value and leveraging the value of a long-term investment. Um, whilst it's hugely centralised wealth, the, the estates in London, sort of the, the, the Howard de Waldens, the, the, the Portmans, the, the West Duke of Westminster land holdings, the curation of, of those estates over hundreds of years Yes, I'm not saying that it, it being held by those, those few families was a good thing, but the idea that they understood investments actually sort of return value, they could deeply invest into place. And so I, I think that's, for me, there's, there's a sort of hope there that if you could structure, I think that the phrase is patient capital, people who can take a, sort of a, a long-term view of things, um, then the immediacy to extract value hopefully goes away. And the idea to, to invest in quality, in longevity, in actually deep success of place becomes actually tangible and bankable. Um, I say, I, I, I see a lot of our problems is that Yes, it's been a sort of build it, sell it, walk away from responsibility type mentality. Yes, it's delivered the homes we really desperately need, but has it delivered them in a lasting way and a way that will, say, create those successful places of the future? I think the jury's out. So yeah, my somehow, and I, I don't have the answers, but. I, I fear it's actually trying to bring sort of longer term thinking into it um, is part of the solution. No, no, I agree. And you know, as you were as you were talking there on a previous episode, guest we have is Will Polisano, who works in the digital asset space, and we were talking there a lot about kind of fractionalized ownership, yeah. and the, maybe with some of these other systems. You know, we talk about financial systems. Um, crypto, some of these other things, yeah. maybe kind of opening up opportunities for fractionalized ownership for these. Yeah. If you could create an estate, you know, in a similar way, but it's an estate that's, you know, uh, sort of, yeah, there's much more kind of crowdfunded in that sense that, that has much more kind of community this, engagement within it. There, there were some great models in the 1970s uh, around this. And yeah, I think those, those stakeholders have to be, I think, vested in place, not just financially. Again, that, that could lead to a sort of, yeah, an exiting sort of uh, at an opportune moment. You, you could see how it leads to booms and busts and things. I think somehow factoring, and it, it could be through sort of digital means and cryptos, a relationship with time. And okay, what is your investment worth in a hundred years? And how do you actually deliver and then curate and support and nurture that place to maximize that hundred year horizon and i think that will actually 
saying this aloud, I can see how this could align with some of these environmental imperatives and sort of things we're hearing from the big global insurance agencies and sort of stranded assets and things that actually don't have that durability. Maybe the, the, the sort of growing pains or, or this, this crisis we're in leads us to a place where thinking is fundamentally more sustainable, that yeah. we can't be working to five, ten year sort of time frames. We, we've got to really think what is the world going to look like in a in hundred years. Who's prepared to invest today to, to realise that? Yeah, and that's where, and that's where um, you know, built environment thinking should be well placed yeah. because uh, of, of, of multiple industries, we do have to think longer term. You know, we are historically thinking about design lives and we're looking both backwards and forwards at history about how cities and places evolve and what works successfully and what doesn't. So you would think that the skill set is there to enable this slightly longer term mindset in, within our industry. Well, I mentioned we've sort of returned to architecture in, in the last few years with a keener focus and things like when you're weighing up how you are investing your carbon in, in the embodied energy of a building, exactly that. There are components that we're designing that in our minds stand there in a hundred years time. And whilst we do have a particular issue that we can't really afford to create any more carbon emissions in the next 20 years. Actually, in a more sustainable view of development, if you can say that parts of those buildings, if, if they are a precious resource of, of material and energy, they've got to be durable. And so, say, I think it comes through in some of the buildings we're designing and, and delivering at the moment. There's almost a visual hierarchy of these pieces, the pieces that are a hugely valuable investment of our shared natural capital, which if we're going to take the responsibility of, of delivering, have got to last. And then there are other layers on the building that their lives will be shorter or they will be sort of ingredients in a circular economy that can quite easily be stripped and reprocessed and, and, and returned to the material cycle. And so we found, I think, after nearly 20 years, more of a language of the, the design we're interested in that, that taps into this and say, uh, yes, maybe we're going to have to sort of build an awful lot less for a short while. But when we do return to, to accommodating needs, I think we need to go back and mine our existing built environment as much as we can. We do need to, to look where actually renewable materials are the appropriate materials. And, and maybe we'll need to develop a, a, a culture of maintenance, which is a lot more about replacement more frequently. But at the heart of it, I think there will be parts of buildings that you just got to think these are your sort of lifetime investments and how on that basis might they even be a programmatic it could be used as housing for the next 50 years but then it could be used to something else how do we design buildings to be repurposed so um yeah no no completely agree and in a nice way in a nice circular fashion we've kind of come back a little bit round to some of those early yeah things we were discussing today about regenerative um, processes and when you can think about that within buildings, within systems and, and within the, yeah, the, the wider ecosystem, that's where it gets really interesting and I think that's why speaking to you today has been really great David. Um, so I've just got one final question for you which is one that was left by our previous guest and um, as they don't know, they leave it not knowing who it's for, how do you define social value? I kind of talked about some of this but how would you define it sort of in an elevator pitch? I don't know how these two thoughts converge into an answer. One is, for a long time we spoke about the democratising of, of the process. And this is why things like Open Desk, the furniture company, spins out or Wiki House. And that democracy we're interested in is not sort of periodically giving someone a, a vote to choose their leader. It's about actually a, a profound equality into being sort of able to action your own lives and actually bring down the, the, the barriers to that. So 
there's the social value, not in a sort of Western liberal way to say democracy as such, it, it's more a, a profound democracy and it, giving them an agency, a, a word you picked up. And I suppose that that's also a, a theme of ours is about a permissiveness, actually. How do we create an openness for people to really take action themselves? And that does come back to, to our buildings and the ideas that they're infrastructures or platforms and they really are just a step up to then the person and even in that description of 100 year sort of visions, I'm not going to be here in more than perhaps 20 years time. Um, so it will be the responsibility of others to, to pick up the baton and, and reinterpret and do. And so the, I think the social value to us, yes, it, it comes down to both an individual or helping an individual and collective agency to, to affect those changes. Sort of managed to. No, 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 you yeah. did. Yeah. That. Yeah. That was, yeah. It's really, yeah, really insightful, succinct. And I think it, and it sums up everything that you're, yeah. you're doing here. So, so, David, that's a really nice way to end. And I say, very grateful for you giving time for the relationship we've got. Yeah. And, um, yeah, really enjoy seeing well, what you're doing. I'm, I'm, I'm passing the mantle on, Tom. Now, now exactly. yeah, we're, we're throwing down the gauntlet. Exactly. And, uh, yeah, want to see, yeah, what, what, what you managed to achieve. Because I do think there is a, a deeper alignment in this sort of set of values and, and vision. And we and others I'm sure you'll speak to will explore it in their own ways. And we need that diversity of exploration because none of us have a solution and there won't be one solution. So... Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm rooting for you as well. Good. <laughs> All right, David. Thanks yeah. for your time. Thank you for listening to the People Grow Places podcast. For more information, visit growplaces.com and follow us at We Grow Places across all social channels. See you next time.